So welcome to this presentation. This will be about proving the resistance against infinitely long subspace trails and more specifically on how to choose the linear layer in a partial SPN scheme. So this is joint work together with Lorenzo and Christian and my name is Marcus. So let me first start by giving you a short overview. So we'll first talk about the motivation. Why is this important? Uh, then we'll talk about partial SVN schemes. After that, there's a short introduction to subspace trails. And then uh, I'll give the results of the paper, the main results, namely infinitely long subspace trails with inactive and with active S-boxes. So we consider these two cases separately. And at the end, I'll talk about some practical results from our work. So let's start. Uh, recently, there has been some popularity about things, for example, zero knowledge use cases and multi body computation scenarios. And in these use cases, some schemes are um, quite popular, namely schemes which are based on partial SPN like structures or which are even partial SPNs. So these schemes um, include, for example, Hades Mimsy or Poseidon or Starcut. But unfortunately, there have been some vulner vulnerabilities in these schemes, and they were found, for example, in these two papers, so in a crypto paper and uh, in a Eurocrypt paper. But these vulnerabilities are only for some particular cases, so for some of the proposed instances, but not for all of them. So the goal in this work is to answer the question how to essentially guarantee security in general for any such partial SPN like scheme. All right, but what is a partially SPN scheme? So let me first start with an SPN scheme, so a substitution permutation network. We have, uh, so this is a classical one. We have uh, some inputs, then we have a nonlinear layer, after that an affine layer and so on. And we do this for a finite number of rounds. So the state size is T in this example here, and we also use TS boxes in each state, so essentially a full nonlinear layer. And the affine function or the affine layer is uh, mostly a, a multiplication by some matrix, so the linear layer, plus the addition of a round constant or a round key. And this is an SBN. And if we have a partial SBN, then what we do is essentially we include, instead of having a full nonlinear layer, we have a partial nonlinear layer. So in this example, we use only one S-box instead of four S-boxes, but everything else stays the same. So most importantly, the affine layer stays the same. All right, so the question we try to answer in this work is, which properties does the linear layer M have to satisfy in order to prevent infinity long truncated differentials with probability one? And they're actually related to subspace trace, as we'll see in a minute. But first, what is a subspace trail? Well, if we consider, for example, this set of subspaces here, u1 to u r plus 1, and these are all proper subspaces, then if this relation here holds, so if essentially the round function applied to some of these subspaces plus um, constant value here in, in f uh, is a subspace of the following subspace plus, again, some value, then we call this set here an R-round subspace trail. So this is not yet um, infinitely long, this is just an ordinary subspace trail for this specific round function R. And further, if all these U's here are the same, then we say that the subspace trail is invariant. And we can also go further and talk about iterative subspace trails. So for example, if we have uh, these V's here, and uh, though these are subspaces again, proper subspaces, and if they repeat themselves after some uh, after some rounds, so for example, with a period of R, then we talk about an iterative, so an infinitely long subspace trail, which is uh, iterative. And what is the relation between truncated differentials with probability 1 and with uh, subspace trails? So we essentially have this relation here, which already has been studied in the literature before, and essentially it allows us to focus on differences rather than uh, two different uh, inputs, for example. And this also simplifies um, a lot of a lot of our results because essentially we focus purely on subspace trace instead of these differences in both the analysis and also in our tools. All right, so if we come back to our PSBN schemes, so for example, if we consider S, so this S here as the solution set of 
these equations essentially. So we want to have some zero here. And for example, the zero is now a zero difference. So we want to have some zero difference here, some zero difference also here, and some zero difference here, since the S boxes are then not active. Then in general, the dimension of this uh, solution set here is one. And what happens is, well, that the, that, so the difference in x zero would be zero, uh, same as here in this round, and also in here, but we don't know if it's still zero here. So probably not, but it may also be zero here. And essentially the, the, the results or results show how to construct the linear layer such that we have a non-zero difference here, such that we are safe, essentially, because we can always do this. And it's well formulated in more detail here, but essentially it's the same as before. We just built S such that we produce these zeros. We can, of course, only do this uh, with this method for a finite number of rounds since we lose the freedom then. And essentially this is then a subspace tray with no active S boxes. But of course, with, with this approach only, we, we can't do this for an infinite number of rounds, just for a finite number of rounds. And this is always possible here for partial SPN schemes. So what are then infinitely long subspace trays with these inactive S boxes? This is the first part. And first we we'll focus on the properties of the linear layer. So for example, if we have some matrix M, which is used as the linear layer, and we have some eigenvalues here, um, and we have some eigenspaces, then we know from linear algebra that essentially if we take some element of these eigenspaces and we multiply the matrix by this element, then essentially the result will be the same, the same element times some eigenvalue here, so magnitude of that. And if we now consider an initial subspace here, denoted by IS, which is essentially uh, generated by these eigenspaces intersected with these E's here, and each E essentially means, where it's defined here, that if we have a difference, then we only have it where we have no S boxes, because we use S S boxes. So essentially, these are the unit vectors at the positions where there are no S boxes. And if we build such a space, then from, from this definition here, of course, IS generates an infinitely long invariant subspace trade. And with an example, we can also see this. So we have here the, the nonlinear layer, and remember that the S box is, in this example here, only applied to the first word. Also, we are working over a prime field here. Uh, then if we have this nonlinear layer times the matrix, or some matrix, plus the round key in that case, um, then we will know since zero, so this value here is an eigenvector of M, we will know that the subspace, which is generated by this eigenvector, generates an infinitely long invariant subspace trail. And note that this is very important that we have a zero at the first position, since it, since it essentially means that the S box here doesn't uh, change the result, or is not active. But this is uh, not uh, not enough because what happens, for example, if the matrix or the matrix squared they have no eigenspaces, and this is indeed the case for some of the star cut matrices analyzed in this work here, and then the eigenspace condition is not sufficient, and the matrix might still be vulnerable. So what we need is something stronger, and uh, this is formulated here. And it's actually uh, not not so so complicated. So essentially. IS, so the, the the initial space, generates an infinitely long invariant subspace tree if and only if this condition here is fulfilled. So essentially it means that some subspace is invariant through the matrix. This is this condition here. And this subspace has to be, um, so, so IS has to be a subspace of this subspace here. And we can, we can also gener uh, generalize this to iterative long trace if we just replace the matrix M by the matrix to the power of L, so to a power of, so if we replace it with the power of the matrix. And also from, from our paper also, uh, if there's no invariant subspace trail, then there also is, that there's no iter iterative subspace trail either. All right, so how do we actually find these M invariant subspaces, which fulfill essentially this condition here? Well, it turns out there's a theorem, so the primary decomposition theorem, and I will not go into the detail here, but essentially it allows us to split the full space here 
um, into uh, decomposition, so into m invariant subspaces, these AIs here. And they are m invariant since uh, this condition here holds. So what we can do in order to find infinitely long subspace trails is we first apply this theorem in order to find all the m invariant AIs. And then we use the decomposition to find the trails where we just define these subspaces here, where we again use the AIs and intersect them with these E's. We need them such that we actually tell the system that no S-boxes um, must be activated here. So first as S-boxes are inactive, and then we just compute new spaces until they st stabilize. So either we have this uh, stabilization here, or we reach eventually a dimension which is zero. And the proof to why that works is in the paper. But essentially at the end, we know that the matrix M is vulnerable with respect to this input space here, if and only if the final dimension is greater than zero. Otherwise, there are no vulnerabilities, at least when talking about inactive S-boxes. And this can also be generalized if we go, so if, if so if we want to find iterative trace, then we just replace again the M, the matrix M by a power of it. And indeed, the initial subspace is then L round invariant. So this was about inactive S-boxes. Now let me also talk about the active S-boxes. So here we search for infinitely long subspace trails with active S-boxes. And first, again, so a very the, the intuitive approach of it. So we know if we have active S-boxes that they must not change the space, otherwise it doesn't work, of course. And so the intuitive approach would be to ensure that each of the inactive S-boxes, they're actually inactive. But if an S-box is active, then the space generated by the single unit vector at its position, so for example, the, the, the space generated the, the first S-box here, at the first position, uh, this space has to be fully included in the initial subspace. So this space is generated by a unit vector. And if these two conditions here are fulfilled, then what we have in the end is that the active S-boxes do not change the subspace. And in more detail, we have the following condition here. So again, we have an initial, initial subspace here, so this P1s, P2s, and so on. And um, this IS here essentially it has, has some additional um, conditions. So for example, we have this uh, large I here, which contains the indices of active S boxes. And for this set here, for the I set, if both of these conditions are fulfilled, and these are essentially uh, the conditions uh, from the previous slide here, just written down formally. So if the initial subspace is um, intersected with essentially the positions of the active S boxes and the positions of the inactive S boxes is the initial subspace. And if for every of the active S boxes, we have that the space in, um, generated by it is fully included in IS, then essentially IS generates an infinity long invariant subspace trail with active S boxes um, with respect to the active S box positions in this set here. And yeah, what this essentially means is that we allow to activate words only where active S-boxes are allowed, so where we allow them as a sign or attacker. And if an S-box is active, then every possible output of this S-box is also an element of the space here. So when applying the S-boxes now, the subspace IS essentially remains the same. But there are some problems with this approach. So for example, computing all the possible P's, so the, these subspaces here, sorry, um, this is not very easy because it depends on the size of the field. It quickly gets uh, very expensive and we cannot directly construct the initial subspace. So we would need something like exhaustive search. Um, also, it provides only sufficient conditions. So a matrix which does not satisfy these conditions might still be vulnerable somehow if we have such a method. And what's also a problem is that the method for the inactive trace, so with these AIs, uh, does not really work here since the subspace may involve uh, multiple AIs. Sorry, there's a typo here. Um, so this does not work here and for an efficient algorithm, we cannot really use this method. So what do we do then? 
our approach is actually based on something already given in the literature, and it's a constructive strategy. So we first start with some um, with an I, which is generated by the active S box positions, since we know that these uh, unit vectors they have to be um, they have to be contained in the full space. In in the sorry not in the full space but in the initial space. And now if we choose these vectors here or these bases here, we just keep increasing the dimension until it stabilizes under m. And what we do here is again we add the vectors m to the power so m to the power of j times e i, since we know that by definition these must be contained in the initial subspace. And then if for every s box or every position essentially we have that um, that essentially all those are contained in this i, so the, the matrix to the power times some unit vector at the active position and so on, then the subspace which is generated, the subspace trail which is generated by this initial subspace here generates an infinitely long subspace trail, invariant subspace trail with active S box position, uh, with active S boxes um, in these positions here. So again, we have this set where we essentially denote where we want to have the active S boxes. And just the notation, so this j here, this, this single j, is the maximum j for all, for all those j i's we need for each of the positions. But if the previous condition is not fulfilled, so we don't have this condition here, then uh, it, it doesn't stabilize really, and instead of stabilizing, it gets uh, the dimension of the space we work with gets larger. And essentially, it's the dimension as before, plus one. And this means that eventually, the largest possible dimension t will be reached with this method. And in this case, so if we reach the maximum dimension, then no infinity long invariant subspace tree with active s box, uh, with active s boxes exists for the for the s boxes chosen in this uh, capital I here. And this can be generalized also to infinity long iterative trails by using multiple sets i. So what does that mean? So instead of allowing only a fixed number of active S boxes or a fixed set of active S boxes, we change this set with every round. Since we don't have an invariant trail, or we don't want to have an invariant trail, but an iterative trail. So it may, so the subspaces may be different from round to round. So let me also give some practical results. So we consider a very generic SPN scheme where we again have a round function defined by a nonlinear layer and then some affine layer. We have only one S box per round and we focus on prime fields. And in the paper, there are also results for binary fields. And we focus on two classes of matrices, namely random invertible matrices and random Cauchy matrices, which are NDS. So first about the inactive S boxes. So we see that uh, essentially the field size plays a significant role. And in particular, if the field size is low, so for example, if we have a four bit field, uh, T is the state size four, then we have a very so a considerable um, percentage of vulnerable matrices in both cases. So for random and virtual matrices, but also for Cauchy matrices. But if the, so if the, if the field size is larger, so for example, 16 bits, uh, 8 bits, 12 bits, then we see that the percentage of vulnerable matrices is very low. And the results are similar in the case of active S boxes. So again, the percentage is higher if we consider small fields, and it starts to get low if we consider larger fields, which means essentially, if we have a scheme uh, where the field size is quite large, then without testing, um, the, the percentage of the matrix being vulnerable is quite low. All right, so if we basically include all of the results we have in the paper, so which means infinitely long uh, invariant trays, iterative trays, both for the case of inactive S boxes and active S boxes, we see that we have, for example, around 16% of vulnerable, so around 16% of the matrices are vulnerable if we consider again smaller fields. But again, if we essentially increase the field size, the percentage of a matrix being vulnerable gets quite low again, but still higher since here we consider all the results of the paper, not just inactive or active S boxes. And of course we have to fix some period 
uh, up to which we search for the trails, the iterative one. So let me um, summarize with a sufficient condition, which we also give and with a short summary here. So a sufficient condition, um, we have seen before that all the results we analyze essentially need m invariant subspaces. So the idea is that we could just guarantee that no m invariant subspace exists. And this is possible by the following theorem, and we have to prove in the paper. So essentially, if all the minimal polynomials of the matrix M, M to the power of 2, uh, until some fixed period again, if all these minimal polynomials are of maximum degree and also irreducible, then there is no infinitely long subspace, subspace trail with or without active S-boxes of period less than or equal to L. So what this um, theorem allows us is to basically easily check if a matrix, uh, if we can use a matrix. But uh, the condition is only sufficient, which means that there are some secure matrices which uh, do not fulfill this condition, but are still secure. So as a summary, we have determined uh, conditions for the security of linear layers in partial SPN schemes, and we consider both prime fields and also binary fields, and both inactive S-boxes and also active S-boxes. More details are given in the full paper, so which includes uh, proofs to these theorems, but also algorithms and tools, and the tools are also available here under this URL here. And let me also mention that differential attacks, so we considered truncated differentials with probability 1 in our paper, but differential attacks are not the only concern, and indeed algebraic attacks may also be important to consider, because essentially we can exploit that the, the degree grows slower if we, uh, if we consider such uh, these subspaces. And this has also been uh, discussed in this crypto paper here. And finally, the results allowed us to fix some potential issues with Hades MIMC, but also with Poseidon and Starcut. Thank you very much.